Hello and welcome to the next podcast where we talk about the wealth management firm of the future in detail and go deep on some of the key findings from a research project that we have been working on in partnership with Bank of New York, Mellon Pershing. I'm Mark Bruno, the Managing Director of Wealth Management at Informa Connect, and I am thrilled to have one of our favorite friends from the BNY Mellon Pershing team on here. We have Bill Bruckner, who's a Managing Director over at Pershing. And Bill, thank you so much for taking some time out to join us here today on the next podcast to talk about what I think are some of the most interesting key findings. Pleasure having you and thank you for making time, Bill. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. It's great to be back with you. And Bill, we've talked about so many different things. We've done our webinar together recently. We had an amazing conversation with hundreds of advisors about the wealth management firm of the future. A ton of questions, more questions that we could get to in the hour. But a lot of the questions that we got during the webinar and a lot of the feedback we're getting from the wealth management audience is really just about the role that technology will play in building the wealth management firm of the future. I know at BNY Mellon Pershing, you have a very broad role. You work with a lot of different types of wealth management companies across different channels, and you're focused on a number of different challenges right? that they're all trying to navigate right now. Before we get into detail on technology and some of the key findings, could you provide a little bit of an overview of your role and how you might be working with some of your different clients on technology? Sure, Mark, I'd love to. I get to lead our uh, consulting and implementation teams. And as you mentioned, it is fairly broad. In addition to technology, we also provide consultation on business strategy, growth plans, and uh, operations as well. And then by having the integrated um, implementation team, we're able to take the strategy, whether that's technology, operations, et cetera, and put fingers to keys and help clients bring that strategy to life. Excellent. So we have a lot to cover here, uh, but and we will try and stay focused on technology. Um, and you've recently authored a blog that will be featured as part of the next project here that is titled How Technology Will Transform the Future of Wealth Management. Um, now, we know that technology has dramatically reshaped the industry over the last five to 10 years, um, and we know that it will continue to transform the future of the business. If we can maybe get into some specifics, what are some key areas, some specific developments that you think could have the most impact on the way wealth managers work in the future? Well, we can't talk about the wealth management firm of the future without really drilling into technology. So when I think about some of the key themes, it's really the, the rise of mobile and personalization within technology. So let's talk about mobile first. I mean, the, the rise of mobile is just amazing to me. When I think about 11 years ago, so 2011, I was being transferred to San Francisco. And from my apartment in New York City, I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I needed to find a place to live. And entirely online, now granted it was a desktop computer I was using, but entirely online, I was able to secure and sign a lease on an apartment in San Francisco. Now, I didn't know if there was actually going to be an apartment waiting for me when I got there, but sure enough, it was, and everything worked out perfectly. Yet you fast forward to, uh, to 2020, and we all have uh, COVID to deal with. And the thought of opening an account online was still a fairly revolutionary concept. So I really think that that accelerated the rise of mobile within our industry. And when I say accelerated, you know, what, what we saw first was basically a replication of the analog process via digital channel. And clients very quickly said, you know, that's not, that's not what I wanted. It's better than having to sign a million pieces of paper, but you, you kind of just gave me a Word document electronically. So it's really kind of the same experience. And I'm, and I'm telling you, if it's not on my phone or on my device, it's, it's kind of irrelevant to me. And I'd really like to do something even the next level. So what we're seeing is more and more firms go to uh, a click to sign type of environment and really help engage their clients in a very collaborative and uh, immersive way via their device. So I, um, I'm just really awestruck by how quickly we've pivoted to mobile in our industry. And the other thing that ties into personalization, it's one aspect of it, that immersive experience that I mentioned, but it goes a lot deeper. Like clients really want a more personalized experience and the technology is really enabling that to happen. So when you think about the rise of ESG, like that's one way that clients are able to personalize their portfolios a little more, but then they wanted to go deeper than that and, and technology is able to make that happen. So examples of that are um, you know, direct indexing 
So clients can be a little bit more careful about their tax consequences that they might have in their portfolio. Well, what enabled that to happen was really the technology behind fractional share investing. And when you think about personalization, what's more personal than instead of trying to make clients think about things in terms of shares, they can say, I, I want to invest $50,000 of my money in Tesla because I just bought one and I think it's fantastic. It just really personalizes the, the whole construct of it for clients. And a third, or a th a third way that uh, we're seeing more personalization is technologies enabled greater access to alternative investments. So it's really democratized access to things like private markets that really wouldn't have been accessible to, uh, to everyday clients a couple of years ago. So I really think personalization and, and the rise of mobile are two of the most important themes that we've seen. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think I have a few thoughts on that. One, I'm glad there was an apartment when you showed up in San Francisco, right? <laughs> not if as glad not... as I was. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it takes something. It's amazing how, you know, 10 years ago, that seemed you know, so conceptual. Um, and now it's just part of our everyday. And I would agree with you. And we've had a couple of discussions on you know, earlier podcasts where, you know, post March, 2020, I think we saw the industry probably experience, you know, 10 years worth of change in a period of 18 to 24 months. Um, and use of mobile, right? the digital onboarding, um, and the ease of doing business with a lot of wealth management companies has significantly improved in a short period of time. So yes, absolutely 100%, we are aligned. And of course, in our think tank that we hosted earlier this year, we kept hearing more and more about you know, mass personalization or mass customization. And I think that there's been a lot of progress. You touched on some of the, the areas where we've seen the most, and I think we'll continue to see a lot more progress from a personalization standpoint as we look ahead. Speaking of looking ahead, uh, every technology conference you go to, it seems like there are four, five, six sessions that are talking about artificial intelligence. Um, we hear AI all the time, but we see it a lot less. I know it's actually harder to see. A lot of it is behind the scenes. I would love to get your sense for you know, how you see artificial intelligence reshaping the wealth management industry as we think about the wealth management firm of the future. Mark, this is one of my favorite topics, and I, I couldn't agree more with you. This is definitely the, you know, to use a cliche, the, the thing to see around the corner or what's coming over the horizon. It's, it's happening pretty quickly. Um, I think there's a, a few cool things happening right around us. One of them is the rise of AI in financial planning. So if you think about the rise of Monte Carlo years ago, and that's been maybe not as popular recently, people have started to refute it, say it's not as valuable as some might have once thought that it was. We can now use AI to come up with a different type of scenario planning that we can incorporate into people's financial plans. And one of them that I think is really fascinating is longevity planning. So when you think about classic financial planning, what's the number one topic? Am I going to outlive my money? Can I retire? When you think about being able to use AI in a longevity planning environment, it's just fantastic. So you can not just make a guess at how long someone's going to live, but you can really use AI to take anonymized demographic data and make better judgments about what someone's longevity looks like. So I think that's just that's just fascinating and has the potential to really revolutionize the, the industry. And that's all coming pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, 2020, mid 2021, I hosted a session on the intersection of health and wealth and longevity planning at, at a conference. And you know this was really nowhere on the radar yet, but fast forward only about a year, year and a half, and, and it's really getting some traction and people are really talking about it. So I think that's going to continue to accelerate. The other, the other place where I'm seeing it used, seeing AI used more and more is within the next best action um, planning. So I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Mark, I started my career at Wachovia, which a lot of people may not even remember Wachovia being a, an independent institution. But mm -hmm. even back then in the 90s, we had the early example of next, next best action kind of mining the bank data, looking for changes in direct deposits, looking for people that we thought might need a home equity line of credit, things like that. It was very rudimentary at the time. 
and uh, but still really neat. I mean, you fast forward to now and so many more inputs that can be used for artificial intelligence to look at and try to make recommendations for advisors to contact clients, whether that's like I mentioned, seeing a change in direct deposit, like, oh, this person might have a new job, mm-hmm. better talk to them about that 401k rollover, looking for transactions that might signal a baby on the way, got to talk to them about 529 planning, et cetera. So those are really the two areas, the longevity planning and the next best action that we're seeing a, a lot of activity in the AI space. Yeah, that's interesting, especially the longevity piece, because in our research that we did together, when we asked advisors to tell us you know, what service they think that they will be providing more than any other over the next five years, retirement income is right at the top of the list. I know it's not a huge surprise given the demographics and how many people are entering retirement every day, but 10,000 people every turn day. 65 every day. <laughs> Let that number soak in. <laughs> and, and it's you know, obviously you know, a snowball that has is been getting bigger and bigger right? It's for the last couple of years. And you see more advisors who have repositioned themselves really as retirement planners and risk managers to some extent. So to have a tool right, that can help them do some of the analysis around you know, longevity and longevity risk would be incredibly helpful. I should also note that when we did one of the first next podcast interviews, it was with Andrew Altfest, who runs Altfest Wealth here in New York. Andrew also runs FP Alpha and FP Alpha is using AI in a different way too. They're actually using it take a really complex you know, trust or legal agreement that could be 200 pages. Um, they've developed some AI that can essentially scrape that page. And instead of investing 20, 40, 60 hours in reading it and pulling out the key notes, the AI can do it for you. Um, and the more it does, the more it learns. So I bring that up because we've talked about it a little bit here on the next podcast, but it's also a really good example of how there are so many different applications that could be you incorporated into the wealth management business over the next couple of years. So thank you for putting yeah, AI. I don't think we've even level. scratched the surface on what we could do with AI. No. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how quickly um, it takes off once people start to see the results, right? So the more we talk about this, the more people like Andrew and others are introducing you know, relevant day-to-day applications, the faster it will get, the faster it'll take off and the faster the wealth management firm of the future comes together. That's right. uh, and spe- speaking of, I know you work with a number of advisors, you know, directly talk with a lot of advisory firms, but you also at BMI Mellon, you work across you know, a number of large you know, enterprise wealth management organizations. Um, when you're talking to those firms, what are they prioritizing right now from a technology perspective? That's a great question, Mark. And you're right. We do get to work with firms of all different shapes and sizes and business models. And that provides us with a view into what's really most important for various firms. But universally, we're seeing a couple of themes. One of them is looking for simplification of the complex. And there are a couple of ways that that can go. But what we found is advisors universally are are somewhat time starved and are looking to get some time back. And by simplifying the complex and whether that's outsourcing investment decisions, whether that's integrating a more streamlined performance reporting package, whether that's um, looking to use technology tools to make it easier to prepare for client meetings, just that simplification of the complex is is the number one theme that I would say um, we're seeing across our client base. The second is um, unfortunately less exciting, but potentially more impactful. And that is just a focus on cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't mean this to sound snarky, but like all of the stuff we've talked about goes out the window if you no longer have a wealth management firm to serve clients through. And that unfortunately could happen if there's a really bad cybersecurity breach. So we're incredibly focused on that at, at BMY Mellon Pershing, as you can imagine, but we are talking to clients about how they need to be focused on it as well. You know, they can't have a breach in their client database. You know, you, you hear about these um, firms that just have their server sitting out in the open, um, and it's just unfortunately there are a lot of bad actors in the world, yeah. and it's entirely too much risk to take without being extremely careful about your cybersecurity. Uh, protocols. It's uh, like you said, it may not be the most exciting topic, (laughs) but 
I could make an argument that it's the most important topic. You know, one of the most you know, important elements of being successful in any business is staying in business. And <laughs> the uh, you read about it every day, how many you know, data breaches and compromises there are at really large organizations. Um, and if that happens within our world, there is obviously a tremendous amount of confidential private information that can be damaging to advisors, their clients across the board. Um, so can't have a conversation about technology and the future of wealth management without bringing cyber into the, into the mix. Um, and it, it's great to hear that it is at the top of the list for some of the largest organizations out there that are supporting the largest number of advisors. So thank you for reinforcing that. And Bill, I know we've covered a lot of ground here, but as you kind of think about where we've seen you know, advance, advances in technology, where we'll see more advancements and developments in technology. I'm curious if there's any one particular area that you found is a pain point for advisors right now that you think will start to you know, improve and that we'll start to see more solutions specifically address over the next several years. The number one pain point that I see for advisors, we covered a little bit, which is just that they're starved for time. But if we go a little bit deeper on that, um, advisors really are looking to build a little bit more scale in their business. And there's a couple reasons that they need to do that. The first of which is we, you know, we talked about the 10,000 people per day, mm -hmm. but that really comes also down to, unfortunately, intergenerational wealth transfer. So what I'm seeing are a lot of advisors really try to build relationships with the next generation of their clients. So if you think about that, what that can lead to if the advisor's successful is they've got today, say, one client with $10 million, but, the, but when that wealth transfers, they may have four clients at $2.5 million that they still want to serve. And if you extrapolate that out and they're successful in retaining those relationships, they find themselves servicing more and more and more relationships at a slightly lower AUM number than they may have had originally. But the way to do that is to build scale. And we're seeing them look to, to uh, implement technology solutions that allow them to build scale, serve those clients just as effectively as they had without adding a ton of work or cost to their practice. Yeah, I think that is the $10 billion question. If you wanted to put a number is how do you create that scale? You talked before about um, customization and personalization. Um, and the more you customize, the more time that requires if you don't have the right technology processes and workflows in place. Um, and I think your example of that $10 million client becoming four to $2.5 million clients really hits home with me. Um, that doesn't even take into consideration how much work you have to do to retain those other three, right. <laughs> three clients, right? But thank you for bringing right. that into the mix as well, Bill. I appreciate it. And the tide is unfortunately working against a lot of advisors. The statistic is uh, not in our favor that the next generation will use the former generation's advisor. So we've really got to get started on that now. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of where it all comes together, Mark. One of the best ways to get started on that now is to build that relationship and really provide all the technology tools that that next generation would be expecting from their advisor. And we saw it in our research. You know, I mentioned the retirement right. income piece at the top of the list, right behind it was intergenerational wealth planning um, in terms of the services that most advisors know they need to provide more and more effectively moving forward. So a lot of work to be done, but I think you've given us some clear lanes to focus on as we think about navigating the next several years. And as our audience looks at building the wealth management firm of the future. So Bill, thank you so much for stopping by the next podcast. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure having you on. Thanks, Mark. It was a pleasure being here. And thank you to everybody for pushing play on the next podca podcast here today. Again, I'm Mark Bruno, the head of the Wealth Management Group at Informa Connect. Thank you, everyone, for stopping by. Thank you, Bill, again, for being here. And thank you to the BNY Mellon team for supporting this podcast and the overall next wealth management firm of the future project. We look forward to having everybody back on the ne next episode of the next podcast. Thanks for joining, everyone.